that it's giving you a constant output. If the output varies over time, that means you have arcing going on. If it's constant, that means everything is peachy. Uh, it's useful also just to look at the quality factor. I'm sure everyone here knows what a quality factor is. So basically, it's the, uh, well, you have your bandwidth, you have your peak frequency. It's one divided by the other. Everything is great. So, OK. Back to the mechanical side of things. Um, you need to shield your RF system to keep it from, uh, well, from stray pulses that might be coming in. So just housing it in something like an aluminum sheet box is enough for that. Uh, you need to ensure a consistent ground. So if you braze on copper flashing to connect your inductor coil to your system capacitor to your ground, that'll be good. Delrin standoffs to prevent arcing. So here are just the BNC connectors to your function generator here and up here. So if you just make little standoffs out of Delrin, keep the system from arcing. Uh, those just, as an aside, are the uh, gauges of wire I used. But that, obviously, you can change depending on what you, what you want it to be. Also, well, this is a bit of review from before. So you need a function generator and an amplifier. This is what you're applying to the copper Ds. These, um, I guess it's technically possible to build your own, but probably it's easier to already have your own or buy them from eBay. Um, so <laughs> ideally, you want to apply Square pulses at the system's characteristic frequency or sine waves also are, uh, those are fine too. Um, that's it for the RF system. Now, last two things we're going to be talking about, oh good, and there's time, um, talking about the ion source and the ion detector. So for my system, I was accelerating protons. I think in a few slides I'll be talking about problems associated with accelerating electrons. So for a proton ion source, you're using electrons to ionize a stream of hydrogen gas. And ionized hydrogen gas is protons. That's where they come from. You generate the electrons using something called thermionic emission. Now, good slide about that. So what thermionic emission is, you have a conductor that's at a high temperature, something like 1,000 to 3,000 Kelvin hot conductor, they have enough kinetic energy. They have all this temperature, so they're oscillating very fast. They're moving. They have mass, so they have kinetic energy. Enough of that to escape from the bonds that are holding them to the surface of the conductor. So these electrons overcome the electrostatic binding energy. They jump up. Now, if you have a source that is more positively biased than that conductor, the electrons then are accelerated towards that positive thing, because that is what electrons do. So in this system, an easy way to do this is you use a neodymium filament. A neodymium filament gets very, very hot if you apply a fairly small voltage about it. Okay. Um, that is negatively biased. So you apply your 10 volts, 15 volts to that. The electrons have enough kinetic energy, start jumping up, and they start going to because it's negatively biased, ground is positive for them, so they start jumping up towards your system ground. So you have a constant stream of electrons flowing from the hot filament to the system ground. And just to go back to this slide, this is the coiled up neodymium filament there. And then the electrodes for that and the hydrogen stream. Now, right, and this just shows you need about 10 volts to get the 1,000 uh, Kelvin for the thermionic emission, because it has just 22 ohms of resistance, that coil of wire. Um, right. Now, the second thing you need is the hydrogen source. Now, this, uh, you can just get regular tank of hydrogen fairly easily, but the tricky thing is you need a needle valve. You can buy these used. They're kind of expensive to get them new to the tank outlet. And a needle, needle valves 
are important because they're very good at maintaining a very constant, very small flow of a gas that's coming out. And these, good, I have a slide just for those because they're important. So constant calibrated low flow rate over very long periods of time. Very long periods of time meaning a day or something. Now, they have a small opening there with a long tapered seat. You have a needle-shaped plunger, which is on the edge of a fine threaded screw that fits in that seat. So you turn your valve here, that goes out just a bit, and then you're able to get a small stream coming out, um, well, in the direction of out of the screen. There. That's the inlet. This is the outlet there. Can't just use a regular valve. Now, uh, Right, as promised, here's the bit about electrons. So when you accelerate charged particles on a curved flight path, you get something called Bremsstrahlung radiation, uh, which is basically uh, photons in the soft X-ray range that come out perpendicular to the flight path. Now, if you're accelerating protons with the sort of magnetic fields that you can readily get, the protons don't get fast enough to have Bremsstrahlung radiation, but if you accelerate electrons, they do. So you have x-rays pouring off of your detector, which are bad for you and uh, other people standing near. So you need to um, put lead bricks around it if you decide to accelerate electrons. Now, it'd also be a good idea. So if you're accelerating protons in the way that I mentioned before, you'll probably also have some stray electrons from the thermionic emission that are coming out, so you want, you want lead bricks anyway, but it'd be far, far more of a problem if you're accelerating electrons. And for the detector, this is the last bit, which is good because we're kind of running out of time. One of the simplest ways of, if you just want to detect your protons or electrons or other ions and not run a reaction, is to use something called a Faraday cup. Now, schematically, on the right, there's a Faraday cup. You have M plus, which is just indicative of any sort of ion there. Thank you so much for this laser pointer, by the way. Um, striking the metal detector here, so you have an ion hitting a metal detector, the charge goes up, not by a very large amount, because it's just an ion, but still, it increases. And you just have a meter that is measuring the electric current as it goes to ground. And so, in practice, what you want to do is to connect the metal to a sort of capacitor to increase the signal to noise. So it fills up the capacitor and then discharges. Or, um, or if you want a very fine-tuned value, you can just hook up your ammeter directly to the piece of metal that has the ions impinging upon it. Now, here's a photo of one. This is, this is not from mine. This is from the Rutgers Cyclotron. There's a, I'm going to post the website for the Rutgers Cyclotron. It's very detailed, uh, very useful information on there. So you have a copper rod in there, which is connected to an amplifier. That amplifier is connected to, well, through the ammeter to ground. You also need an electron shield on the back side of it. So you have your protons which are oscillating like this, they're positive. And then you have oscillating in the opposite direction, or rather spiraling in the opposite direction, you have your electrons. They're going in two different directions because they have different signs of their charge. So you need a shield on the back of your Faraday cup because otherwise your electrons impinging on it would mess up your count. They would nullify a large number of your protons. Now, the nice thing about these Faraday cups is that it's fairly easy to incorporate